Hi, Lizzie. Chag Sameach. Chag Sameach. How you doing? Good. I think we're going to talk about morning sex. Morning sex, afternoon sex, evening sex. It's, right. it's well, morning now, right? Technically, it's the middle of the night, pre-morning, and we're in the middle of Shavuot. We're pre-recording. Um, but I figured I'll do it in bed. So welcome to my bedroom. Here, I'm not showing you everything, but you know, this is the basics. That's a nice lamp you got next to your bed. No, this is this lamp is vintage. I've had it for a long time for at least two houses. Um, but welcome to Harlem. And I'm in your home in Chicago. You got all your Jewish books and tchotchkes. Oh, my Jewish books and tchotchkes. Yep. Yep. Got a nice view of them. So, all right. You want to talk about fornication? Seventh commandment. Seventh commandment? Lotin af. Lotin af. Colloquially translated as? Do not commit adultery. Correct. And as we started thinking about this night, where our colleagues and us are remixing and rebooting and reinterpreting the 10 sayings, you know, translating it with some intentionality seems to make sense. I mean, first of all, 10 commandments, command. Sarata Dibrot doesn't mean that exactly. No, it's like 10 things God said. 10 things the character of God in the Torah said. Correct. Like the top 10, here's how to, in the context of covenant. And um, the one we chose, or was chosen, for, however that happened. The one that Destiny uh, chose for us. We chose for us, more. from our various perspectives uh, and positions in life, is one that raises some questions. Not that we are saying you know, free fall, but is that what Lotin Af means? Does it really mean the sense of adultery as in, you know, one spouse cheating on one's other spouse? And what are the issues here from a feminist perspective, from a queer perspective, from a postmodern, here we are, and I'm not even talking about Corona, because here we are on screens, and we know that both the level of sexual frustration, abuse, domestic abuse, erotic uh, growth and, and dissatisfaction and creativity is um, quite out there. And there are, there are numbers that are, we're beginning to see, especially on, on sadly on abuse, but um, there are so many questions about what does it mean to be in erotic integrity and emotional integrity in the middle of all this. Yeah. We get there. So it does occur to me that maybe just so that people have a sense of what it is that we're taking issue with, reinterpreting, turning on its head, can I, can I actually read the, the Rashi on the, like how this is traditionally defined? Because otherwise, like, I, I feel like um, we're going to, um, we're going to, I want people to know what it is that we're even arguing with here. Is okay. Okay. Well, so, so, but I would say, let's start at the very beginning. Yeah. Okay. Just in case somebody just dropped into this call. So here we are, chapter 19 in Exodus, later on in Deuteronomy, list of 10 from God via Moses to the people, 10 rules. We're going to get back in a moment and see it like, who was it really spoken to? Uh, and who is not spoken to in this text? Um, so we're going to come back and look at that in a moment, plus a couple of nice little trivia from um, the history of that commandment. But we're going to start with um, chapter 19, verse 13 in the Bible, uh, which is those five latter commandments. It's just like, boom, boom, boom. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Um, and so, don't covet. Go ahead. And the last one, number 10, no coveting. And no coveting your neighbor's house, wife, slave, ox, or ass, or anything or, that is your neighbor's. In that, li- right, in that order, more or less. Right. Yeah. So, lotinaf ni'uf could be that sense of what we call adultery. Could yeah. Could be something a little more comprehensive. So, you're yeah. bringing us the Rashi, so... Okay. He, says, he says the term teen af, adultery, is technically applicable to the case of the married woman. So basically, sleeping with somebody outside your marriage, I guess, 
not as big a deal as sleeping with a married woman. That is the definition of adultery. Yeah, is that how you understand it? Yeah, because it's like sleeping with somebody else's partner. Right, because you are damaging the property of the owner, the other man. Right. right. So I just want to say, whoever's with us in the middle of the night watching this, that it's 2020. I'm a gay, single man. You are a hetero, flexible, married, hetero, flexible, married, woman, married to man. Right. You got kids. I got kids. So, you know, mine are a little older than you. So we're already beginning to have those talks. And yours are coming. And I don't uh, have those talks yet. Oh, it's, we'll talk. It's kind of great. But, um, and we're asking about the morality and the ethics of this text that is like the cornerstone of our tradition. And I'm like, mm, yes, and. And I want to say that I'm reading this in this context of who we are. Uh, knowing that in 2020, the president of this country has, if not been officially accused of adultery, then like, I don't know what Michael Cohen's doing in jail exactly, but like, right? And it's like, ah. Officially accused. He's definitely been officially accused. I guess not officially proven, but officially accused. Right. I, I get, who knows what's, what's official anymore, but right. And it's like, and it's like one out of five of married couples, or, uh, the, the, like the numbers are are extraordinary. Yeah, I, something that I think is really interesting. My understanding is that anthropologists don't even consider human being or Homo sapiens as a species monogamous. We're like semi-monogamous, and the reason is exactly that. That like first of all, not all human cultures are monogamous in the first place. But even the ones that are, if you like really get into it with people and you know hand people an anonymous survey, have you ever slept with somebody outside of your marriage? you're going to get many more answers of yes than, you know, than you would if you, you know, just asked couples both, you know, above board, you know, would you ever sleep with somebody outside of your marriage? No, of course not. No. But I think that's not really the truth. Right. So at some point, if we get to it in our session as two people who are officiating as clergy at weddings, how we approach that question, because I think you and me have a bit of a refreshing, uh, take on that in, in the context of many other of our colleagues. So before we go there, um, I want to show you two excursions. Um, one, and either you or me can share a screen, um, or I can maybe put it in the, ch no, it's best to share. Sure. I'll put it, I'll, I'll put it on the screen. Right. Uh, no, actually you put it on the screen because I'm not seeing it on my screen. Okay, so hold on. So, um, but you're the host, so you got to you got to make me co-host. Oh, 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 oh! Here, wait, hang on. I got it. I got uh, it. Do this. Ah, oh, you got it. Okay. Can you see it? Yeah, totally. So, the text on the top that I want to begin with is with uh, my dear friend and teacher. Is she uh, really your dear friend? Esther, yeah, we're very, we, yeah. Who are you friends with all these famous people? It's, it's just, Esther and I have known each other for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, she's really, uh, she's amazing. Um, um, and she, I mean, I feel like she, her, her name has come into the popular consciousness over the last few years. She had an incredibly popular TED Talk about adultery, about uh, cheating in marriage. Correct. So her first book, Mating in Captivity, that came out like seven, eight years ago or more um, is remarkable and been used a lot. And her more recent book, uh, The State of Affairs, uh, is also looking at boldly at these issues. She was on Oprah yesterday for an hour. It was like fascinating. Um, so this is a quote of hers that I love from her first book. She says, love rests on two pillars, surrender and autonomy. Our need for togetherness exists alongside our need for separateness. Corona, while we're in social isolation and sheltering in peace and going crazy, speak for myself, um, has like a strange little whiff of relation, relationship with this text where, but if we go back to the relationship notes to love, the surrender and autonomy, like I need me, this is about me, and I need to completely give up so I can be with you and vice versa. 
And that's the Anila Dodi, Vedodi, Li, to my beloved, beloved to me, and the face to face, and the cherubim, and Buber, and Levinas, and all these things. Um, and it's the paradox of how do we handle the togetherness and the separateness in an age where we get to choose partnership, where until maybe a generation, a uh, hundred to 200 years ago, the choice of partner was that of very, very few. You didn't choose a married. Right. It was not a choice. So now we have a choice of what she's talking about is the, the gamut of the erotic capability of holding the space between a long, you know, separateness and, and, and togetherness and how there is a spectrum to what it means when you are in relationship and committed to each other. So I'm bringing her as a, as a guiding principle for us to come back to and how do we redefine this notion of monogamy yeah. and, and adultery. And the second is while I was researching this, I found something delightful. Uh, the King James Bible that um, came out in... 1631, did you well, say? Well, this one came out in 1631. Ah, okay. I think that's the second or third printing. Uh, by the Royal Printer of London, um, made a mistake. Uh, scholars think that the guy was framed. It was like, in, like a, was like a whole industry thing. But basically, there were two mistakes in the printed in mass numbers uh, Bible on behalf of the king. The first and incredible mistake was that instead of saying, thou shall not commit adultery, it very helpfully said, thou shalt commit adultery. And the Archbishop of Canterbury was appalled and the king, I forget who it was at that time. I don't think it's James anymore. Uh, we're like, you, what? So they brought the printer in. There was a whole public trial. He was, he was fined and they burnt all the copies except 14 of them uh, in existence, 13 in illustrious libraries all over the world, including New York and, and London. One is at large. I feel like one thing that that actually, you know, shows is that there are people who really do read the Bible, like very closely. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like for a lot of people it just sits on the, on the shelf, just looking pretty, like, you know, I pat myself on the back because I've got a Bible. But like, if you're going to catch that mistake, that meant you were really reading it. So, I mean, no, I mean, I, I'm imagining this moment. It's like at the Royal Chapel, the Archbishop stands up and like the Ten Commandments <laughs> for the new printed book by His Majesty, and he's like, "Thou shalt commit." The, they're like, "No, <laughs> not." He's like, "The oh, oh my God, can you imagine?" So is that a great story? So it's called the Wicked Bible. It's been like there's a whole thing. I think it's a movie in that. Anyway, those little anecdotes. I mean, Freud would say that here you have England talk about rulers and. The, 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 the flaunting of, of rules. So just as we're preambling into this conversation late night about fornication and adultery, illustrious teachers to walk us through it, some strange contexts. Um, we talked about taking it a step backwards before we even talk about the actual delivery of the Ten Commandments. Who's there? Who's receiving wow. it? And where does the feminist critique begin probing it right there? Great. You want to take us there? Yeah, sure. You know, have you seen The Prince of Egypt? It's been a while, but yeah. It's like, it's become one of my favorite movies. You can watch it on YouTube in like little segments. The, but why I'm thinking about it is because like the, the climax of the movie, the end when like all of the people are leaving, the men and the women and the children and the, you know, like the heir of Rav, all the people who left with them. And it's just like this egalitarian uh, like festival energy of all of these people, you know, just like all of these people together. And, um, and uh, unlike the Charlton Heston movie about the 10 commandments, the Prince of Egypt just stops, you know, at, at the other end of the sea when they're free. Um, well, and it has the big song finale. Oh, I, I mean, it's just, it's so great. And so I guess I'm, I'm raising that up as a sort of counterpoint to juxtapose what, it sort of seems like is happening in the actual Torah um, or who Moses is, is speaking to when he's preparing people for the Ten Commandments. So we can, we can just look at this for a second. Um, doo -doo -doo. 
So all of the people, I mean, that big egalitarian mess of people, the men and the women and the children and the everybody, were all there in the desert together. We know they were. They all left together. And yet, before the giving of the Aserah Tadibrot, the Ten Commandments, Ten Sayings, Moses comes down the mountain to the people, and he warns the people to stay pure, and they wash their clothes. And he says to the people, be ready for the third day. Don't go near a woman. So who is he talking to? Right. Who's, who's about to receive the, who needs to stay pure for these commandments? It sort of seems like, well, not, not the women. Um, so, all right, here, should we just read the Judith Plaskow? Yeah. All right, let's just read. Um, and I just want to say, I remember being taught this as a kid, and it's obviously, of course, first of all, it's about the notion, like the Levitical laws of what's holy and what's not, and sperm, and you know, sex and all that. But so that's like Torah or Revelation or God. Wait, wait, wait. Hang on. I feel sex. what you just said, what you just said presumes a level of familiarity with the laws of purity and the laws of sex and semen and purity that were written in the Talmud that like a yeshiva buffer who grew up in Israel, like yourself, would know. But somebody watching this might not actually know. So the, the whole three days thing, don't go near a woman. Why would you not be pure? if you went near a woman. To simplify it is the moment there was intercourse and semen was exchanged, it's probably the wrong word, inserted, then there is a level of lack of purity, ritual purity. Because right. semen, I mean, this is, you know, the chi, if you'd like, is being, has been exposed. Um, and and there are, there's a lot of different things. I mean, it's all already in Leviticus, whether it's he or she or they. But basically, the assumption here that these three days that are known as Loshet Yemei Hachana, the three days of preparation for revelation, are the days of real elevation right. of body, mind, soul. That on one level is beautiful. Yeah? Right. Absolutely. On the other level, it's both A, sex negative, and B, Right? What if you, right? Like I remember reading this thing, oh, well, if I'm into boys, then off the hook. Right. You know, and it's sort of like there would have been a different way to say this uh, if what you were saying was, okay, everyone refrain from sexual intercourse to right. focus, you know, on your inner life to purify and align yourself, right? There would have been a different way to say that so that it applied to everyone. Right, the and people are going to hear us right now and roll their eyes and say, of course, it's what it meant. And I'm like, yes, except he didn't. And you're going to see why this little instruction, when it's echoed in the seventh and in the 10th commandment, actually makes you really think, was this written by men on behalf of men to men? And therefore today, as we are assembling what patriarchy is and what it's not, we actually want to challenge that. Also important to mention that when, when the divine source gives the instructions to Moses, it doesn't say the thing about three days. Moses That's right. Oh, yeah. No, Moses totally, like, slips that in there. Yeah. Um, okay. Let me read this so, Judith Plaska here. Okay. At the so, let's say, let's say, so let's say who she is for those of us who don't know. Go ahead. Go ahead. Judith Plaska, the first and greatest feminist Jewish scholar of our time, still alive and still writing and teaching. Um, who's, um, yeah, this is from a piece she wrote for Jew School two years ago, but it's based on a lot of her writings about standing, um, you know. She wrote Standing Again at Sinai, yeah. yeah. That's, that's Which her. is like pre, uh, it's, it's like required reading in any Jewish Feminism 101 class, Absolutely. as it was for me in college. How many years ago? A lot. Okay, here we go. Um, at the formative moment in Jewish history, when presumably the whole people of Israel stands in awe and trembling at the base of Mount Sinai, waiting for God to descend upon the mountain and establish the covenant, Moses turns to the assembled community and says, we've seen this already, be ready for the third day, do not go near a woman. Moses wants to ensure that the people are ritually prepared to receive God's presence and an emission of semen renders both a man and his female partner temporarily unfit to approach the sacred. But Moses does not say men and women don't go near each other. Instead, at this central juncture in the Jewish saga, he renders women invisible as a part of the congregation about to enter the covenant. 
these words are deeply troubling for at least two reasons. First, they are a paradigm of the treatment of women as other, both elsewhere in this portion and throughout the Torah. Again and again, the Torah seems to assume that the Israelite nation consists only of male heads of household. It records the experiences of men, but not the experiences of women. For example, the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, presupposes a community of male hearers. Second, entry into the covenant at Sinai is not just a one-time event, but an experience to be re appropriated by every generation. Every time the portion is chanted, whether as part of the annual cycle of Torah readings or as the special reading for Shavuot, women are thrust aside once again, eavesdropping on a conversation among men and between men and God. The text thus potentially evokes a continuing sense of exclusion and disorientation in women. The whole Jewish people supposedly stood at Sinai were we there or were we not there? If we were there, what did we hear when the men heard, do not go near a woman? If we were not there originally, can we be there now? We are here now. Here we are. We are yeah. very much here. Yeah, it's a great text. Um, so, like, reading this as a woman already, yeah, reading this as a woman who was ordained in the conservative movement, you know, I wrote papers on... Um, the assumption of mitzvot as women, you know, that were designed for men and sort of prohibited to women for a very long time. And now women are mostly expected to observe um, in exactly the same way. So like one direction you could take this is, okay, well, whatever was said to men at that time uh, should just be assumed upon women in an equal and in an equal way now, um, what, what, which would mean um, women have freedom to sleep with other people outside of marriage as long as the, those people aren't married. According to Rashi. According to Rashi, yes, right, according right. to his interpretation of what it means. Right. So it's, is that what we want? <laughs> well, or you, you take this, the so-called pshat, simple reading of whatever lotin af means in its biblical context of the patriarchal notion that the husband owns, the husband, Baal, is the proprietor of the wife, was there to provide what she's supposed to provide. And he can and she can't. I mean, we know from the Talmudic and Halachic that, you know, Masechet Sota and from the Torah, the whole notion of what a husband can, or a man can and a woman can't. So we can say that to level the playing field, Let's go beyond male, female. Partners in a relationship, including same sex, and all gender, you know, options, going by the moral standings of this text are prohibited from having affairs. Again, the theory between, th you know, the gap between theory and practice, right? But in theory, we can say, if we are feminizing, querying, talking back to the text and bringing dignity to everybody, and all couples in wedding, in, in married relationships who've made a covenant with each other are therefore barred, forbidden, Puritan commandments from having an affair. I don't think that's what it's saying, though. I don't, because I don't think that the Torah is defining uh, sex outside of marriage for the man as an affair. Right? For the Baal, sex outside of marriage is not an affair. For the woman, it is. And so it sort of depends on who you want to go with. If you're, if, right? Okay. So then how do you read the very pshat, the very simple reading of that commandment? Lotin af, do not have adultery, uh, small print. Except if you are a married hetero man, then you can as long as that object of your desire is not somebody else's property. Correct. As in married woman. Correct. I think that that's the way that it, I mean, that's the way that it has been interpreted. So that's, that's Rashi, yeah. But I'm pretty sure, I mean, until relatively recently, um, Judaism also wasn't a mono an exclusively monogamous religion. Men had multiple wives, right? Women didn't have multiple husbands, but men had multiple wives. Right, a thousand years ago. Well, 
Or, no, not even. No, 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 sure. no. Oh, yeah. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, I'm saying as, you know, as, a, as, a, as, as a, an Ashkenazi, yes. Ashkenazi, that's true. Um, okay, so one, say, one thing we can say in 2020, all right, people, however you are in domestic coupling, this, is, this makes sense. There's trust, there's vulnerability, there's intimacy that grows in trust. And if you start opening it up, uh, officially or not, then a lot will be gained, and we'll come back to that. But you're going to lose something. So without being, you know, puritanical and judgmental, and then like, uh, well, you know, or, or and just you know, forbid just the woman or everybody. It's better to keep it as solid as you can. One option. Right. Another option of reading this text is saying, okay. This is Moses. This is a guy. And whoever wrote this is talking in a very specific hetero, masculine, tribal, Semitic, binary, patriarchal, all those words. And it's on us to re, you know, salvage the goods from this old chip that serves some but not all. And a la Plaska and all of us say, okay. So how do I reinterpret this? And can I say that lotin af, ni'uf, is not necessarily um, having sex with someone else who's not your lawful partner, but can be seen as sexual impropriety, as, as being abusive, as flaunting consent, as being, um, as sullying, like I really don't want to sound like that, but like, sullying the, the, the sanctity or the beauty and the sexiness of love sex by making it fast food, by making it um, all the ways in which it isn't sacred, but just actually dirty in a, in a, in a, in a non-fun way. Well, I, I think there's, you know, what makes it maybe different from, you know, the ways in which we can uh, act on impulses, right? And I, I think a lot of what the Torah is trying to do, and certainly the way that I was taught about what many of the mitzvot are about, are about channeling our impulses in healthy ways, um, because we've got sexual instincts, and we also have instincts toward food, and you know, like gluttony. And um, the thing is about gluttony; it's not necessarily going to like inspire somebody's rage or jealousy if they find out that you like ate a pint of Ben and Jerry's, but your partner might in fact fly into a rage if they found out that you slept with somebody else um, without consent and without, you know, that there's a trust there that you were just talking about, you know, and that like, that that's what this is a breach of. And so this, this whole idea of ni'uf being about, uh, about the contract, the breach between partners and breaching that but like that contract could be construed in many different ways. It, it's not necessarily the kind of exclusive monogamous um, and punitive sort of implications that um, we're maybe like seeing here and that uh, certainly sort of come with this whole, you know, uh, this section of the Torah, low, low, low. And all of these, by the way, are punishable by death, right? These are, these are really, really serious violations. Um, are they all punishable by death? No. Are they? Pretty sure. I'm not, not the coveting thing. Um, but like I was in, in my, in my reading up on this a little bit. Um, it, so it says, you know, one shouldn't steal the, so that stealing money is not punishable by death. So the interpretation is that it has to be, that has to actually be about stealing people because that would be. Right. No, it's true. Right? And um, so, one doesn't murder, one shouldn't, one shouldn't incriminate someone or um, uh, condemn someone to death with their words. So that's the bearing false witness for which you would also be put to death and then adultery as well. Haven't you seen that scene in um, Handmaid's Tale? When, ah, uh, I, I, I was not allowed to watch that. Why? Okay. All right, fine. I, I have a very strange threshold for type of like the utopian and dystopian stuff I like. 
I mean, here's my bedtime reading. Have you read Octavia Butler? Remember her? Do I need to read that book? Um, I'm not sure if need is the appropriate word here. Octavia Butler was an African-American lesbian sci-fi writer in the 90s. Wow. She wrote these two books, The Parable of the Sower and The Parable of the Talents. I'm now in the talent, the second one. It's, it's futuristic about an America that is crazy. And it starts in 2024. So back when she wrote it, it was considered, wow. And now it's like, oh, yes. Um, and and um, anyway. Anyway. Anyway, um, all I'm saying is that dystopian reading I can handle, Handmaid's Tale was too close to home. Well, it definitely is, is quite close to home. And then there are certain scenes where you're like, okay, you know, I, I get what you're doing here, but I, I can't really see America in 2020 being quite like this. But one of those scenes is um, somebody is, is caught uh, practicing adultery. You know, a, a married woman is sleeping with a guy and they both get um, pushed off of a diving board with weights attached to their feet and they both drown in the presence of the whole community because it's a sin punishable by death, not just for the adulterer, uh, the, the adulterer, but also the person, you know, the, the, the object of, of the sexual relationship and the person, you know, the married, the married yeah. man sleeping with the woman who's married. Right. Um, so yeah, I think this is like, this is. No, this is still, still big and Esther Perel and Dan Savage and every other therapist and sex therapist, the Dr. Ruth's of the world will tell you, this is a huge issue that is dealing with all of our libido repressed and expressed and is now more than ever because of technology, because of the access. Again, I'm putting Corona aside for a moment. Uh, I'm sure that in your rabbinic career, and I know in mine, the, the, the consulting, working with couples, um, with whatever rabbinic pastoral training we've got, um, happened several times, you know, I would say numerous times. Certainly in the, in the, in the context of working with couples on their wedding preparation and for their ceremony, and in some cases, checking in with them after. We um, you talk about that a little bit. So I know you work with couples writing a ketuba, you know, and talking about some of the important and often overlooked areas that are like, that maybe at the beginning of a relationship, people are just like, yeah, 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 we're good. And it's like, no, no, these are things you should talk about now. Yeah. And you talk about this. Sure. So when I meet with a couple that wants to go on their wedding journey with me officiating, I ask them to work with me on, or like I'm guiding them towards working on their own version of a ketubah, of a contract, a covenant, um, in, that's based on three prenups. So the first one is a financial prenup for them to have an honest conversation with facilitation about money. Who's got what, who might have what, how do they deal, how do they, uh, uh, leave that completely as transparent as you can. And this is like with a, do, do they have this uh, approved by a lawyer or this is more like, let's just get it all out on the table. It's their call. But I basically tell them there's plenty of, of precedents for prenups. And again, for some people it's more important than others, but basically just be fully transparent on how money is exchanged. Yeah. Different bank accounts, one bank account, then debts, then talk about it. No, America wouldn't talk about it. Talk about it. The first. The second is the spiritual prenup, uh, whether it's a Jew, Jew couple or a Jew joy or a Jew, like whatever the spectrum. We um, just define joy. Joy is somebody who's neither a Goy nor a Jew. It's a person not born Jewish who's choosing to love and live and get married, perhaps, to somebody who is Jewish and negotiating those boundaries in any way. Um, so talk about what you believe in. Is it God? Is it after? Whatever, all of that. Yes, kids, no kids. Talk about your faith and go to the hard places and the landmines. And I help, I help them with that on whatever spectrum of what, what do we believe in, what do we value. And the third is a sexual prenup. And I say to them, you might be newly dating or been, you know, engaged for a year, whatever it is. 
Hopefully the sex is great. I don't need details. And in the traditional ketubah, in the traditional wedding, the assumption is that you are in monogamous and the first blessing under the chuppah is, right? It's like basically we are marrying the ones we can and we want, and boom, ring, hands off. And I want to invite you to think about as a couple, like where do you think about that? Like how do you think about that? five years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, right? Where marriage is, tragically, Woody Allen once said, marriage was a good idea when the average lifespan was 32. Um, we live longer, we have many more choices, we have many uh, uh, seductions, and a lot of people blow up their marriages over money, faith, and sex. So if you want me to officiate your wedding, let me help you, and let me make sure that your success goes from 50% divorce to like 80 by having these conversations. So the first two they usually get. The third one, they're like, what do you mean sexual prenup? Um, so I always ask this couple, this, this question here, I'm giving away my tools. I ask um, porn, do you guys watch porn? They get very uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, porn. I just asked you about porn. I know I'm the rabbi, whatever. Everybody watches porn. Um, the, if you guys are like away for a trip for a few weeks or in, whatever, in the same room, same house, different rooms, and one of, one of you watches porn and the other doesn't know, is that cheating? Like, is that lotin off? And they're like, um, and very often there's like this almost comical response where one of them would say, no. And the other would say, well, what do you mean? No. Like how often? And and I was like, great. That's exactly the conversation I want you to have. Start there. And then if you're really brave, go further and go examine what is it, what can it look like, right? And that's where Esther Perel has been so helpful to me of saying there is a spectrum and the expectation that one person will satisfy every single one of your needs, intellectual, emotional, spiritual, sexual, for the long run of your life, tall order. So, so, the, so I open the conversation. Um, it sometimes goes deeper with me. It often goes deeper between them. And they write something that then becomes um, explicit in their ketubah. Right. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the Esther Perel idea that, you know, one has many relationships. The question is just whether they're going to be with the same person. Right. Not, um, I love that idea and uh, think, that, think that that's right on. And also, I don't think I've been doing this long enough. And I think I'm personally, like, I'm, I'm still sort of at the early end of my career to see. I, it's my feeling, though, that many couples that I'm doing, you know, who, who I'm having this conversation with, even if I were to pose those questions, and I'm curious about, uh, I'm curious about, you know, when you sit down with couples, especially in those early years when the sex is great and nobody thinks that they're gonna need, you know, reinforcements or exploration beyond their marriage, you know, you can't read the future. You don't know what it feels like to be five years into it or 10 years into it. Um, so I'm sort of wondering like how, how you actually get couples to realistically predict how they're going to respond in five or 10 years, you know, when they feel completely differently. Right. It's not about prediction. I'm just saying to them, look, chances are things will shift because they do, right? Again, a stare. There's the domestic and there's the erotic. The domestic loves the familiar. The erotic likes new. So how are you going to negotiate the, dom the domestic? And I send them to Esther's talk and to other books and say, I say to them, I suggest that you get a sex therapist or a couples therapist right now while your parade is in full swing so that you've got somebody in your contact list who knows you. So mm -hmm. when the time comes, because you know what? It rains on parades. Plumbing happens, right? Who knows? Maybe you are the perfectly suited couple and you'll deal with all of your needs and wants and desires wisely great who knows so i 
do not know, would, you know, I can count on one hand the exceptions of couples who either already knew them or we got to know each other more and they were like groovy enough to really say, okay, we're really going to talk about this. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and talk to me about it and it being reflected in their marriage uh, ceremony, right. whether it's very discreet and private for them uh, or their witness, or the, the, the immediate circle, um, or whether it was a little more public. But like that's part of the ketubah. Like they're 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 talking about it because the, the original ketubah is a sales contract where the property, aka bride, is handed over from one owner to the other, with you know with bride money. So clearly we're talking back to that. Um, well, and I mean, in, in I think um, you know when I when I have this conversation with couples and we talk about you know whether or not to use the ancient language of the ceremony that was originally designed for exactly the purpose you just described. You know, so hare at mikudeshet li. Mikudeshet meaning like, you are consecrated to me like an item is consecrated for a particular purpose. So right. your body is now mine. Um, and I put this ring on you, I mark you as mine. And uh, you, you transfer from ownership from your parents' house into my house. Um, and, I actually love reinterpreting that such that, you know, Kodesh is about a sense of separateness, right? It's about setting something aside as separate, distinct, um, and in a particular relationship. You're in a particular relationship with whatever it is you've decided is Kodesh. So assuming both partners are giving each other rings and both partners are saying, hooray, at, ata, mekudash, mekudash, at, li, betabat, zok, adat, mashab, right? Like, this, with this ring, um, I, I place on your finger, you become, you, you and me are in a certain kind of relationship that I don't share with anybody else. I don't share that relationship. That said, you know, the idea that it has to be marked with a kind of sexual exclusivity, because once upon a time, that was basically the only kind of exclusivity the um, husband placed over wife, that's where I'm sort of like, I don't know, I feel like there's a lot more that we place into marriage now, right? Now marriage is so much more of a holistic, you know, to your point, spiritual, sexual, also financial, also, you know, child raising faith, um, you know, cultural, certain tastes, you know, like all of these different things at the end of the day, like, uh, you know, people want their marriage partners to help them be better people, to help them grow, you know, to grow with them over time, to be travel partners, you know, to like benefit from reading the same books and talking about ideas and, you know, like all of the things that we hope to find, like to find a best friend and a partner, also to find like a co-CEO to run the business of your home. You know, it's like a lot of pressure, I think, on a marriage that did not exist in the model of marriage um, described in the original Orthodox Ketubah that, you know, that has one partner putting a ring on the finger of the other and declaring ownership over their body. Um, yeah, which just leads, leads me to sort of the same set of questions that you ask couples, um, which sort of, you know, just want to open the question, if this is, if marriage now is so many more things, so then we could go one of two directions. We could either say in all of those things, we are exclusive, you know? Like you don't go to movies with other people. You don't have dinner with other people. You don't spend time with or go on vacation with other people, you know, and we would find that ridiculous. Like, of course you would do those things with other people. You need a community. So then I would say, why don't we sort of place sex in the same category as many of those other things? Um, for the couples for whom it is appropriate, given their contract. Well, yes, Anne, I, I, I agree. Um, and if we're querying the text and thinking about the seventh commandment in a egalitarian, increasingly post-patriarchal world, then first of all, yes, open it up to what spectrum feels like and nuance. And speaking from a purely tantric point of view, right? Tantric is in the- I mean, obviously. Obviously, the erotic art of like spiritually, mystically, and embodiedly, physically investing in the relationship of intimacy with another partner with whom you really go deep 
into the art of love and in the art of love making and I and thou, holy of holies, song of songs, all that tantric stuff. Then I want to say whether you've chosen your partner or as in the older paradigm you didn't, it makes sense to invest resources, discipline, time, commitment to this at least somewhat exclusive relationship. And whether I go to the movies with somebody else and my spouse or partner is jealous, well, that needs to be negotiated about where we spend our, you know, our cultural capital. Um, and I think because the erotic and the sexual is so sacred, yeah. is so transformational, is about all of our energies and so much angst around it, especially in this culture, that if we do develop a positive commandment mm. that talks to this Lotin Af by saying, prioritize love, prioritize trust. Love. Yeah, like not fidelity exactly, but the notion of, of fidelity to each other's commitment. And not in a way that implies a power hierarchy of one partner over the other but implies like a real equality of partners and a, a trust and investment that is mutual as opposed to sort of imposed you know it goes back to the cliche of do we come from fear or do we come from love right. and there is something in these that says listen we know people they're going to steal they're going to kill they're going to cheat they're going to lie they're going to covet so don't that's humans and that's legit. We are. Here we are, thousands of years later. But how do we, because we already started querying and feminizing and challenging the assumptions of the laws and not being with our eyes closed and not being naive, how do we move the needle towards a place of more dignity and equality and love and body positive and sex positive? in a, an era where it's possible that the mosaic authors could not imagine, which is the level of choice, that whether it's good or bad, we're choosing our partners now. And many of us are maybe not making the right choice, so comes choice two, three, or four, if at all. But right, redefining the seventh commandment in an age of choice, as opposed to being chosen for, um, of all the Ten Commandments, I think this one is the most challenging. I mean, the last one too, the coveting, but, um, or at least partially there. So I think this really calls on us to take a deep breath and thank the text verbatim and say there is a paradigm shift here, a holy one that is about intimacy. Ultimately, it's about the sanctity of intimacy and more about love and less about fear. I think that's a great place to leave it. This was really nice talking to you, Amichai. Good night. I'm going to bed. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs>